This video has been brought to you in part by our incredible patrons and their continued support of our endeavors. Thank you. Space. A twinkling tapestry of stars in the night sky. The final frontier, the greatest frontier. Promising amazing discoveries, untold opportunities. A practically endless expanse to explore and inhabit. But if you're a budding starship engineer, the very size that makes the cosmos so appealing is also your biggest hindrance. What to do about the vast distances of space, particularly with interstellar or intergalactic space? And before you say anything, we will discuss the warp drive and variants such as the dark matter drive in a later episode. But until then, buckle in, this is going to be fun. There are many equally promising ideas, each attempting to tackle different problems. Relativistic starships simply try to go as fast as possible. Speed is king here, and mass the enemy. The fastest spacecraft we built so far is the Parker Solar Probe, traveling at over 300,000 kilometers an hour. A lot faster than your car, that's for sure. Well over 100,000 times faster. But to quote a certain British work of fiction, that's peanuts to outer space. For comparison, the speed of light is 1,000 million kilometers per hour. That's about as fast to the Parker Solar Probe as a typical baseball pitch is to a snail. And it's roughly as fast to the Parker Solar Probe is to that car of yours. Much like conventional spacecraft, starships must try and minimize their mass if they're going to get anywhere in a hurry. A very heavy starship may still rack up a respectable speed, but by then, its propellant tanks will be completely dry. Generation ships instead take their time crossing the gulf between stars, slow and steady as they go. These slow boats instead serve as flying colonies, altogether avoiding most of the issues encountered by speedier vessels. Issues we'll cover over the next few episodes. Large, self-sufficient habitats aboard these ships would sustain a multi-generation crew who will spend their entire lives living aboard the ship maintaining it, farming, going about their daily lives, raising the next generation of starship stewards. Generations later, it will be up to the great-grandkids, or even the great-great-grandkids of the initial crew, to hopefully set up a colony at their destination. Both concepts have their merits, and there's a lot of overlap. Relativistic starships must still accommodate their crews, for years at a time, and even the slowest generation ship must still deal with the issues of propellant and debris. An important idea to grasp here is the distinction between propellant and fuel. Fuel is the energy a starship uses to exert some mass, the propellant, in order to gain or lose momentum. Sure, for chemical rockets and a few other designs, fuel and propellant are largely identical. However, for most of the engines capable of propelling a starship, or even fast interplanetary cruisers, fuel and propellant are two very different things. The Daedalus is a two-stage relativistic starship 
able to reach 12% of the speed of light itself. That's as fast as the electrons in an old cathode ray tube monitor. Those old dinosaurs we used to have on our desks. Think about that for a moment. An entire starship, a massive machine larger than a skyscraper, hurtling through space as fast as an electron in a small particle accelerator. So great a mass of propellant is necessary to hurl the vessel and its enormous bulk up to such a speed that the ship must come in two stages. Throwing away its spent tanks and the engines that push them, much as a rocket does. The reduced second stage then lights up, heaving the ship up to its final speed of 120 million kilometers an hour. And yet this tremendous speed is but a crawl compared to the distance of interstellar space. The Daedalus would take 35 years, 35 years, to travel the cosmically puny distance of 4.3 light years to the Alpha Centauri system, the closest star system. To put that in perspective, imagine if it took 35 years to travel a thousand kilometers. That's a speed less than half that of a snail. And that's a machine that can throw itself up to the speed of an electron in an old monitor. To truly reach the stars and touch at least part of that milky tapestry, we must go faster. This is where exhaust velocity becomes vitally important. You see, the faster a starship's exhaust velocity, the more efficient a starship is at high speed. Why? As the starship accelerates, ship velocity approaches exhaust velocity, but in opposing directions, which means that more and more the propellant is simply slowing down from the starship speed. As the ship continues to accelerate, the propellant is of course accelerate along with it, before being hurled out. Eventually, the propellant is only being slowed to a standstill. From the ship's perspective, of course, the propellant is coming out as fast as it ever has. Yet from an external vantage point, we see the ship constantly accelerating propellant and all. Before we know it, the exhaust is no longer at a standstill, but moving in the same direction as the starship. This is horribly inefficient, and caps fusion-powered vessels to little more than 10% of the speed of light. At least, direct fusion vessels. To go faster, a more powerful fuel is needed. The Valkyrie is a single-stage relativistic starship powered by antimatter. Unlike most starship designs which push their cargo, requiring heavy, sturdy structural bracing that limits their length, the Valkyrie would instead pull its cargo behind it on strong tethers, like some kind of gigantic space-age chariot. By using tethers with a very high strength to mass ratio, made of something like carbon nanotubes, which can after all tether an asteroid to a planet, but I digress, the Valkyrie can place their crew quarters and antimatter storage kilometers behind the engines. This can't be done with compressive trusses, they'd crumple and fall apart if made so long, like using paper to hold up a car. Much of the radiation emitted by the antimatter-powered engines simply spreads out and disperses long before reaching the crew. It's like using your thumb to block the sun from your eyes instead of the thick, heavy, actively cooled shield that the much closer Parker Solar Probe requires, right next to the sun. Likewise, the Valkyrie Starship needs only a small and thin shadow shield to shadow the radiation glow from its engines, saving massively on mass. Pun definitely intended, I apologize for nothing. To 
to further cut down on the heavy shielding, the engines were built like a giant fish trap, minimizing their surface area, ironically catching tiny ultralistic particles, not giant space fish. Or space whales for that matter. No space whales, none. How does a space whale even make sense? Anyway, the net outcome of this starship of strings is an ultra light ship that can accelerate up to and back down from 92% of the speed of light. And the Valkyrie manages this with only a single stage. However, before we start celebrating, the job isn't done yet. There are some issues with the Valkyrie that aren't really properly addressed and extrapolations that really need a more thorough investigation. Details that have been glossed over. That said, something similar to the Valkyrie, a long, lean ship, is really the only way we'll ever reach speeds approaching that of light. With some exceptions. But that's a topic we'll come back to in a couple of episodes. In the next episode, we'll discuss the various kinds of starship engines. Until then, keep wondering about space. <laughs>